Welcome everybody again. Um, wonderful having you all here. And uh, you know, this is again very special for us at Rung. Okay, currently uh, we have some of us here on uh, Zoom. There would be others uh, through the CNS uh, social media uh, page on Facebook maybe other channels too. Uh, so this session will be recorded. It's just being recorded and will go live uh, not only on Facebook, but also on the YouTube channel of our co-host Citizens News Service. Okay. Uh, so uh, Ananya, who's the co-host here and uh, of this session and I, uh, are among the founders of Dung Foundation. Uh, Mohammed is uh, one of our advisors. We are a very young, growing uh, foundation, Rung being uh, research for action and nurturing gender and other intersecting identities and issues. Okay, and uh, we are uh, based across India. All right, uh, and it just happened organically. Uh, so many of us are uh, uh, either from the gender and sexual minority community or, uh, you know, identifying as uh, women, maybe queer women, non-binary women. All right. And uh, we are so delighted uh, to have you all. And uh, Mohammed today, again, is... Uh, not only associated with Rung Foundation, but also a dear friend and a uh, young, or, you know, depends, of course, young is a very relative term, uh, a queer uh, activist and uh, works with UNO and UN women. Uh, you know, largely, I think, uh, part-time and as a volunteer uh, on uh, creating safe spaces for uh, queer people in the Middle East and uh, Africa. And uh, I think largely North Africa, right, Muhammad? Yeah. And- uh, North Africa. Okay, fine, great. And uh, Muhammad, as uh, you, uh, also in the poster, uh, which has been revealed, is a student of, undergrad student of uh, one of the life sciences disciplines in Bangalore and uh, also uh, identifies as an intersex person. The preferred pronouns are they, them. And, uh, you know, has uh, had a lot of, lot of personal struggles. He continues having personal struggles and challenges. You know, much of his uh, very adorable smile and warm nature won't reveal. You know, as sometimes they say, the people who seem the happiest actually are also hiding a lot of pain. Okay. And, but yet, Muhammad uh, will share with us uh, how they are uh, coping. And uh, so over to you, Muhammad, who's also a human library and so many other things. You know, I can probably speak for half of the session introducing Muhammad and their immense contribution in various ways to uh, the queer uh, movement and, uh, you know, to supporting queer people in India and other parts of the world. All right. Wonderful again having you here, Muhammad. Over to you. Okay. And please show off your, uh, you know, Intersex Planet t-shirt. Yes, it is significant. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Pushpa. Thank you, Rang Foundation for this. All right. So this is what I'm wearing today, an Intersex Planet. Because I'm an intersex person and the world revolves around mm -hmm. me. So that's why that's the significance of this. Uh, before we get into this session or more like an interactive session, uh, we will let's do a weekly check-in with everyone. How's everyone feeling? Uh, do you have a bottle of water with yourself? Please hydrate if you do. And get yourself in a position where you're comfortable and you please know that you're allowed to leave and join back the session when and if you feel triggered or feel unsafe by what I'm sort of conveying here. Also, whatever I'm talking here, uh, hopefully remains within the space and does not go outside. 
Uh, also, my opinions are my opinions. They are not representative of anyone else. They are not in lived experience of anybody else. Uh, they do not uh, speak behalf of the intersex community here in India or abroad. So they are purely my experiences and my experiences alone. I do not stand to speak for anyone else, and I will not take up anybody else's spaces by doing that. Uh, so you can use the chat box to let me know how you're feeling today and how your day has been so far. It's all right if it, it did not go the way you planned it to be. But please do grab yourself a, a bottle of water. And uh, but, but because I'm fasting, I'm not I'll not be able to do that. But I shall do that when I break my fast at 6:30 uh, p.m. Uh, we'll just wait for like one minute for people to check in. I guess then. Uh, I'll tell you how I feel. I feel a lot of ang anxiety, uh, anxious actually. There was no electricity at my place since like uh, morning and stuff. And I was telling Pushpa repeatedly bugging her at 2 30, saying that, oh my God, I don't have electricity. I don't think I'll be able to do this. And and like till like 2 45, I was sitting on this very position and I'm like so concerned, like not knowing what to do. And I started praying and I'm like, oh my God, please, please, the electricity should come back. And then like the electricity came and I'm like, holy shit, I need to get things together and like log in fast. And then Pushpa is like, yes, yes, we're going to log in and do this. Uh, some of the things that I'll talk here uh, will be in a third person, mostly because I'm at home and I don't want to be vocal about this. So if you do hear a third person perspective on it, know that it's my perspective and not a third person. Uh, glad to have your electricity back. Yes, yeah, I'm glad to have to do this. <laughs> uh, keeping the videos on is your choice. Uh, I might be keeping my video off if and all my bandwidth goes low and you're not able to hear what I'm talking properly. I hope that would be okay. Uh, yes, uh, all right. So, getting on to what uh Pushpa basically asked me to speak or sort of have a session on was on accessibility health accessibility to begin with. and uh i see accessibility as something uh of an approach wherein that approach is based out of in comfort like uh accessibility is this golden triangle if you if, if someone uh is into public health and like disease control, they know that there are there is something called as a golden triangle of healthcare. This golden triangle of healthcare is basically your accessibility, affordability, and quality of healthcare. So accessibility is also about uh, uh, acceptability. It is also about availability. And all of these uh, significant terms make so much sense right now as we see COVID cases increase. Uh, avail availability is something that we are struggling through with oxygens and medications and other forms of, uh, you know, um, uh, medical uh, medical things, medical stuff, uh, as you want to call it. So when I say accessibility, we, we automatically, or a lot of us will think about this image about a person on a wheelchair. And that is what we think about accessibility. But Accessibility for a lot of us is also using a mobile phone. It is also having slow electricity or having slow, no, not electricity, sorry, slow network. You don't have slow electricity. That sense. So you have low network. Accessibility also refers to someone not able to access technology the same way another person. Does. For example, I have difficult time in accessing certain uh, forms of websites. For example, Discord being one of very famous uh, websites that people use for gaming and interaction was not sort of accessible to me. And until a very good friend, she sort of made it accessible. She like made sure that we were able to, you know, understand the basics of it. So I see accessibility that way. It is uh, somewhat, uh, you know, interwoven and interjoined with comfort the easiness like you're able to uh, easily sort of available it and uh, also it also roots in sort of you know uh, the comfort of doing things where you're not being judged for it 
So access of uh, sorry access uh, acceptability is where it is uh, you know sort of interwoven. Now when we talk about uh, availability in healthcare for uh, uh, gender and sexual minority people, we see that there is a lot of uh, use of uh, usually a lot of uh, you know uh, lack of public healthcare facility for a lot of people and. Uh, uh, when we also talk about lack of public health care uh, facilities, we also have to look at healthcare workers not treating uh, gender and sexual minority people rightly, discriminating them, and you know, uh, not giving them access to their medications or making them wait for delayed medication, etc. And some of these experiences uh, are a lot different for a lot of different individuals. Uh, in India, it is you know, a, a lot to do with your caste, caste, uh, sorry, caste, class, religion, language that you speak, uh, your, uh, you know, the financial background that you come from. So some of those experiences are interwoven. And however, uh, as much as we think that our experiences might be similar, uh, you know, these, these factors are the dividing uh, boundaries that come in and say that maybe not, maybe not all experiences are the same. And that's that's the case in my uh, in me you know within me is that the way I have experienced accessibility with healthcare and acceptability in healthcare is very different than you would have. And we sort of think about this is that uh, especially for gender section minority people, you sort of imagine that oh, where does this become a significant factor? Why does the healthcare worker or doctor need to know? Like why do you, whether you come from a square minority or whether you do not, it actually becomes a sort of a, sort of an thing when you consider going to a gynecology, when you consider going to an endocrinologist, when you consider going to somebody who is into reproductive health, and they they have these common set of questions. Uh, I obviously cannot speak. For, for anyone who's come from a gynec background, but I can speak from someone who's been to an endocrinologist. And the questions that we usually say are, uh, you know, you know, do you have a partner? If you do, you have a partner. Uh, is what some progressive med medicals you? Not everyone does that. So if you tell them your partner is not female, generally, and uh, then a lot of set of personal questions will come into it. But if you do, you know tell your partner is uh, whoever they are and the set of questions you receive. Is so that is something that uh, medicals don't sort of sway away from. Uh, I remember this, uh, I remember watching this video on YouTube. Uh, it was uh, by NHS, uh, NHS UK. And uh, they had this uh, counseling session by an anesthesiologist. So, this anesthesiologist comes and uh, you know sort of consults this patient and asks them certain questions before they go into the operation theater. And the questions that they asked there was so like brilliant because it had nothing to do with the person's you know personal life. It had to do more with their medical history. But here in India, we see that apart from asking questions about your medical history, they also dive deep into your personal life and ask if you're married, if you have kids, if you have you know, how many partners you have and based on your honest answers, they give you these judgmental look that sort of creep you out and have gone through that. And it's so, you know, so uncomfortable. So a lot of, uh, so this uncomfortableness that we have comes in your, you know, acceptability is that there is this moral judgment that is being passed and there is this disapproval look given by the, the healthcare workers themselves. And I'm not shitting on any healthcare worker here by just pointing this out. But I am speaking from what my experiences are. And this is something that needs to be normalized more is that we need to critique the med medical system because they have been unfair to the general infection minority, especially in, in Indian context. Now uh, also uh, if you are seeing my poster uh, you ha would have also seen, uh, okay, I'm going to give a trigger warning for this in the chat box. You all can take a minute, about uh, 15, 20 seconds to see what this is about. And I'm going to talk about it in a third perspective. Third person perspective. And if you have any questions, 
uh, you can either share it on the chat box or you can sort of uh, keep them for the end, I believe. I believe the four facilitators will take them. So I've given the trigger warning in the chat box. Uh, and this is important to talk about and needs to be normalized. Because uh, again, the therapy that I'm talking about is seen differently by different people. It is given different names by different people. And uh, we see that a lot of uh, a lot of this therapy is present or prevalent within the general infection minority. And it, uh, it may or may not have to do a lot with, uh, you know, uh, religion as well, because we generally think that, oh, people from Abraham, Abrahamic faith would, would push their uh, children into it. But I've seen people from other states also go into this. So I was sort of shocked for that because uh, I was like, okay, I, I have always thought this as a thing that Abrahamic faith only do this. But then someone was like, no, it doesn't choose religion. And I'm like, that makes sense. So when we talk about uh, this conversion therapy, uh, what it basically is, is, is is that it's not therapy to begin with. Yes, uh, I I don't know why uh, I'm I'm so conflicted with the idea that how how do you call that conversion therapy because it's not therapy. Therapy is something that you uh, somewhere where you go and sort of uh, get a lot of uh, comfort or peace or you know you're able to vent out your troubles or anything as such. But what I see or what I've experienced within that is that it's not a comfortable journey. Uh, one thing to begin with is that most of these practitioners are great orators. I mean, they are brilliant at it. And they, they manipulate you. They give you so many illusions about you. And you're in a state where you approach these people and uh, you're so confused, you're conflicted, and the confliction that they add more upon you is so like troublesome. Because you start believing whatever they tell you, and you feel that they're genuine. So it and it's funny the way they treat you because they are like also accepting about you, and they're like, oh yes, you have definitely fallen into the wrong path, whatever that is. They sort of you know make make you believe that whatever you have experienced is a sort of a feel. So uh, in my experience, it has it was like uh, this particular uh, this particular doctor and the way uh, their medical background. So I was, uh, uh, I think I should talk in a third person. So this person, uh, let's call them Mr. M. Mr. M was so swayed by the doctor's, uh, you know, uh, charisma and like medical background that they came from. And uh, Mr. M kept thinking that uh, this doctor would, you know, help them out and would treat them out. And, that's 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 funny because uh, because when Mr. M did believe that they thought the cure would work and they went into it and uh, although they did not go with their own consent, they were forced into it. Uh, and here is the part of it. When they stopped taking that therapy and they questioned their model, they were told that, uh, Mr. M was told that, you know, it was on their own will that they went into it. And that sort of is an interwoven trauma for Mr. M because they still feel that, you know, they, it is not their fault that they were forced into it, but they're made to feel like it is, it is their choice. Uh, one important, another important thing about uh, this therapy is that uh, there are different forms of Yes, uh, there is not one, it's not a linear thing. You have, uh, I'm sorry if you feel like I'm not prepared for it, it's not that. Uh, a lot of this comes back as trauma for me and I sort of blank out at particular positions because it's like sitting through it and your entire life, you know, flashes in front of you. So if I might stop in between, it's just that I'm thinking and sort of, you know, trying to trying to see and trying to convey what is appropriate in a way that I don't trigger you as well. Because all of these experiences can be very triggering if you do not have a therapist to go back and you know talk sort of share this. Uh, so 
uh, some of the common ways uh, people are given this, this therapy is uh, they have something called as an image therapy. So image therapy, uh, as uh, you know, clear as it sounds, it's, it's like you sit through a series of images and they check your neural activity or brain activity over your reception towards those images. Uh, you have something called as an orgasm therapy. So, need not explaining, but you have what you're doing. Uh, you know, they check your uh, check sort of your uh, sexual response to certain things that they uh, sort of display on the screen, and they all of these uh, therapies that they give you uh, based on those uh, therapies, they give a conclusive report to what needs to be done. In most cases, it is a HRT, that is your um, hormone replacement therapy. In many terrible cases, it is uh, unfortunately shock therapy as well. So, uh, although uh, under the Mental Health Care Act, uh, all of these therapies are illegal and banned, and some of these states have also banned them. But uh, certain doctors are still accountable, certain hospitals still perform them. and uh, the hospital in Bangalore does it behind, although they sort of preach and, you know, uh, sort of say that they are not going to do any of this, they still do it. And it's sad that we are not able to hold them as much as accountable because they're not doing it up front, but behind the doors. Yes. And it's one particular doctor and not the entire hospital administration. Maybe not now, but maybe they are involved. Uh, this is one aspect of it. Uh, Another problem or another in, uh, sort of uh, issue comes in accessibility is with uh, intersex people trying to access uh, medication or trying to access doctors. Now, because I'm an intersex person, I will speak from that perspective, not speak for any other perspective. But I will be honest with you that I have sort of used my male privilege to past because when you look at me, you think about a very uh, is appearing male person. You do not think of any, anything else unless I specify that to you. So uh, I remember this one instance where I had to sort of access medication and I'm gone to the pharmacy and I gave this person, this person prescription. And he looked up to me to, you know, from top to down and he looks at me and he smiled. And I don't like that smile because that smile gave me so much discomfort. And he loudly yells out the medication that I need, and it was so uncomfortable, so violating. I would say, like going, imagine going to the pharmacy and you tell the pharmacist that be hush about it because you don't want people to know what medication you're taking. Uh, and this pharmacist just violates that and loudly yells, and people all glare at you know so that form of humiliation or violation you feel, and I felt that. And I chose to ignore it because I was like, I'm not in a state to protect you. So that that sort of made me realize that, you know, it didn't matter who you are because at that moment, accessibility and acceptability became so much about the medication that you're taking. So I remember going to this another pharmacist once and like trying to access that medication. And that was hormones to begin with. And... <laughs> This uh, pharmacist, uh, he just asked me in, in Hindi, he asked me, I'm going to translate that if anyone does not understand Hindi. He asked me, like, Mard nahi hai. He's like, are you not a man? And I just was stumped. I didn't know what to answer. I just looked and I smiled. And I'm like, I just took the medication, came back and started crying. But it was so you know, traumatizing because your trauma, your trauma does not go, truly go away. It does not truly go away. It, it keeps coming back. And uh, it is so interwoven with a lot of other uh, things out there, you know. Uh, you, you never know what might trigger it. You never know. Although even if you do know what might trigger it, you do not know what instances it might trigger. It. I mean, on social media, we sort of do get, you know, the choice to sort of, you know, use trigger warnings and choose not to read certain things. But in real life, you really don't have that much of an option to be like, 
I mean, you cannot literally go outside and be like trigger warning and then you give something and people you think would listen to you. So this person uh, is someone who regularly supplies medication to our house as well. And whenever I have to order medication from him, uh, because my parents don't know about his incident, it is very traumatizing. And it is very traumatizing to call that pharmacy and sort of, you know, take medication. Uh, Another issue with uh, accessibility for intersex people is that they're often, you know, sort of uh, confused or, you know, intermixed with the trans movement. And uh, the issue with here is that we are two separate identities. To be yes, and uh, mixing us together causes this huge ass issue. It causes this big problem of, you know, our movements and our voices being diluted. And it becomes as one. We are glad it becomes as one because in a way, our voices are still portrayed. Out. But what, what, what happens is that we don't get individually represented. Yes, our voices become diluted. So some, uh, someone just does mention about uh, intersex people, but you do not find intersex people within that very movement. And I think the first time I read the word intersex was in the Nalsa judgment. That's the first time the, so, you know, the Nalsa judgment made sure that they mentioned in the 2014 verdict the word intersex under the trans umbrella, however, which uh, sort of, again, you know, misrepresents the intersex community. At least here in India, I am sort of glad that you know the trans community and intersex community are in solidarity with each other, but in Western countries, you know, do not have that sort of uh, you know uh, intermixing. You have the intersex community independent of the trans community, but the issues uh, or the common uh, traumas that they have are commonly discussed. But uh, here in India, you don't find that. You, uh, I think the first time I met someone who was intersex uh, was through Solidarity Foundation. And I was so excited because I was like, oh my God, there's, there's someone like me. And that excitement, uh, you know, sort of, it didn't die off quickly because there were other people like me and there were other people who have gone through similar experiences, similar traumas, but not the same trauma. Uh, and uh, that was very liberating to know. And then when we had our first, uh, you know, when I uh, went to an intersex meeting or a gathering, I was like, wow, there are, there are more intersex people here. And this is very nice to know. But at the same time, the visibility is so less. It's like, like 20, 30 people throughout India. And you're like, I know there are more people out there, but they don't know that they are intersex. And that's the thing with intersex identities. It's, you know, it's not a rare thing. It's, although it's considered something to be an invisible within the gender sexual minority, uh, your I in the LGBTQIA plus stands for intersex. And it does not stand for ice cream or intersectionality. I've seen that a lot of movements do that. I read somewhere that it stands for intersectionality. Uh, it does not stand for intersectionality. It may, it may uh, uh, no, sorry, it, it does not stand for intersectionality. It stands for uh, a lot of people uh, sort of, you know, uh, think that uh, we are the third gender as well, which is also incorrect. Intersect people are not third gender. Uh, so, okay, I'm legit stumped right now. Uh, okay, I'm going to keep the floor open for questions. Uh, and I'm going to talk more as questions come through. So you are free to ask me anything, like literally anything. Uh, I, however, would choose not to talk about how I was uh, uh, forced into a conversion therapy that is very, very triggering. I'm sorry, and I don't wish to put anyone through that. And I, okay. you're speaking very well, Mohammed. Thank you for that. Uh, Yes, but the floor is open for any question or anything you would like to ask. Uh, another thing that I could go about is uh, accessibility in terms of my endocrinologist. She's a good person, though. 
uh, she's very welcome and very comforting. Some, you know, you get that a lot of comfort that you when you go around talking to your doctor. I think a lot of us, a lot of us queer people, uh, have this discomfort with approaching doctors and medical and healthcare workers. And she, for me, is someone who sort of removes that discomfort because she's like, I'm not gonna eat me alive. We know that she's not gonna eat me alive, but she's also very accepting of uh, who you are in certain ways, not every time, but yes. Uh, although she's very binary oriented and she can be very dismissive of your, who of your self-identity, uh, self identity, uh, self-identity or self-determination, but she makes sure at least you're not, you know, devoid of the availability or accessibility that is up to it. Uh, yes, so I'm willing to take up anything anyone wants to ask, anyone wants to share. An awkward silence has befalled us, but uh, if you want me to talk about my work with uh, with UN, I can do that. I can talk, talk to you about the work that we do with queer refugees, and that would be a good sort of uh, this, uh, you know, icebreaker through. Or I could talk talk to you about. Uh, my experiences as a human book for human library and tell you what human library is all about. Yeah. Um, Mohan? Yes. Uh, I will suggest, and of course, others also can suggest, and finally you decide. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, surely the human library thing, because it's something different. So, it'd be nice to talk a little about that. And uh, I hope I'm not asking for too much. If you can, no, no, not briefly, at all, not at all. Huh? Because that'd be something fun and interesting and very rare, also, right? Yes, and yes. also a little about uh, you know uh, your work uh, with uh, UN because it is so important and very few people who are themselves community members are able to leverage their uh, identity, their experience to be able to give back in such an important and uh, unique way because it's all not very much known, right? Okay. So if you can uh, talk a little about this and that, that'd be great. Okay. And anyone okay. else also, you know, please put your wish list in the chat box, please. Uh, I hope uh, you all are, you know, getting informed and insights. And uh, Mohammed, as we see, is a very cool, he's, uh, they say that, you know, they're conscious, they're anxious and all that. Of course, I'm not denying any of that, but they're also a fantastic speaker, very engaging. So I, I, I presume you're enjoying that part of uh, their personality. Okay. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Pushpa. So uh, human library mm -hmm. to begin with is, uh, when you think about a human library, what comes into your mind? That's the first question that I would ask you as uh, you imagine a library with human beings, that is what human library would literally translate to. And that is what, uh, I'm sorry, this conversion therapy came as conversion therapy. Okay, I'm going to take questions in a while. Uh, so I'll talk about first what is uh, human library. One minute. Yes. So human library to begin with started somewhere in the year 2000, 2001 by this uh, uh, person from uh, the Netherlands. And his idea was basically to have human books who would talk about their experiences and narratives. Like for example, uh, human books such as uh, someone who is a refugee. So uh, if you are from different cities, you have different human library chapters. Like you have human library Mumbai, you have human library Bangalore, you have human library Delhi, and so on. And each of these uh, human libraries will have their human books, who would be a particular book with a particular story. For example, I'm the queer Muslim, but you will have people who are, you know, an HIV uh, HIV person. Uh, or somebody who is uh, uh, 
a biker, I believe, and someone I remember who was a refugee from Sudan living in India, and they spoke about uh, the struggles that they had to go through. There was someone uh, who experienced racism in India uh, as an Anglo uh, Anglo Indian, so they spoke about that. Uh, we had people who spoke about polyamory. We had people who spoke about, uh, you know, coming from a background uh, like, for example, we had a book uh, uh, who had to do like who's being Jewish in India, like their experiences of being uh, a forgotten minority, as they call them. Uh, so you have these different books, and you sit and having uh, you sit around this table, around five six of you. This is before COVID times. Uh, uh, during COVID times, we go on a Zoom meeting like this, and we speak for around 30 to 45 minutes. And in at the end of it, you ask the human book whatever question you sort of you know feel like. Uh, uh, how do I say? Feel like asking the book sort of uh, wherever you have whenever you have so many questions to ask. For example, if I'm a human book right now and I'm talking, talking questions, like one of the questions that was asked just now is that, what are the experiences of being from a minority religion at the same time being sex in India? So this is something that I've commonly answered in, a, in my human library sessions, is that how is your experience of being that? And in a nutshell, it's not a very good, not a very good experience at all to begin with. And uh, how do I say this? Uh, so you have different books to go through. You always get to uh, choose from different books to begin with, and you can read around two to three books if the time that is given. And I remember having this one very funny experience or very enlightening experience to begin. Is that this this parent comes into my session and she's like, uh, "Any of you? Uh, sorry, to begin with, you." Are uh, you are a liar, and whatever you're gonna say is false. It doesn't exist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And believe it or not, by the end of the session, she was weeping, like she was crying. And I, I'm like sitting there, I'm like smiling. With it's so normalized for me to talk about all of that. And uh, I was, she was like, I'm so sorry for judging you. And I'm like, that is the point of human liberty is that you cannot judge a book by itself. So uh, you should all check out Human Library from the different cities that you are. Please do check out Human Library Organization .com as a website uh, that they have, and they will tell you like how, how if you want to be a book, you can sign up for being a book, and you can talk about your experiences as an individual, different experiences. Uh, another thing that Pushpa sort of mentioned is about the work that we do in UN. So I work with queer refugees. I do or I do work with uh, safe spaces to begin with. And when we talk about safe spaces, uh, what's the first thing that comes into our mind uh, is that it's a space where you know we meet up, we do group meetings, or we do you know hangouts together, and uh, that sort of image comes through our mind. And that is what you know, safe spaces are all about. It is a space for the marginalized uh, having a common interwoven trauma to sort of, uh, you know, talk about their issues and talk about, uh, have their discussions go to. So our idea of safe space for queer refugees also stems from the idea that a lot of these refugees come from common, uh, similar countries. Like uh, we have refugees from Palestine, we have refugees from Syria, we have refugees from Iraq and Iran and, we have uh, some of them are refugees within their own country, for example, the uh, Kurdish minority in Turkey. So one of our projects is based out in Turkey. Uh, it's called the Rainbow of Hope. So the way this works is that the space operates as a community service center in the morning, and it becomes a safe space for the refugees who work there in the space in the evening. So in mornings, we have art art classes, all, all of this in reference to pre-COVID times and, and post and right now in COVID times, none of this is really possible for us. Uh, so we used to have art centers, art therapies, uh, we used to have sessions on uh, how to do knitting, how to do, how to, how to make art, how to 
how to do community gardening, how to do terrace work, and like uh, we had people who would uh, come and teach people for free, and we had lawyers who would come and you know solve uh, cases for free. We had doctors who would come and treat people for free. So that sort of a community center, but also a safe space for people. And we did this uh, in uh, Turkey. We did this in Egypt. So in Egypt, again to protect uh, you know. Uh, individuals and to protect their identities, we had to go with names that are not traditional. So we couldn't keep an organization's name like, okay, this is a rehabilitation center for service. So we had to go with something like Austin Jane Appreciation Society. Now, funny part is that we don't talk about Austin Jane at all in that space in Egypt. It's just for name's sake so that people don't have a, you know, they don't get suspicious to what's happening. We tell people that we discuss Austin Jane literature there, but we don't actually. I don't. I don't know if anyone knows about Austin Jane literature even out there. It's just a random thought that we thought that one day we'll open up a space that is called Austin Jane Association. The same goes for uh, Latin Book Club of Lebanon that we have. Nobody talks about Latin books there. Nobody talks about Latin literature there. We did get people starting coming to us and fill out application forms to discuss Latin literature, and we are like, we don't have anyone out here that, you know, uh, uh, we don't have anyone here who understands Latin to be with. So under these uh, guises, you know, we started our safe spaces. And uh, until 2019, December, we had around 800 people. And a lot of uh, these people, uh, we helped them get them uh, visa. We make sure their documentation is in proper order if they want to apply for asylum uh, status in other countries. And around 40 uh, individuals or families, as you can, as you want to call it, we have helped them get sort of an asylum status in Canada as of now. Uh, if you would ask me what are my challenges, is one is that I operate everything sitting here in India. So like unable to travel, unable to be present out there. Another challenge that we face is with language. A uh, lot of them speak different forms and dialects of Arabic. So at times it does get a little difficult to manage that, you know, different in dialect, different in, uh, uh, you know, political uh, affiliations and political beliefs. Because <clears throat> the refugees that we have from Syria have, which, you know, uphold a different political belief than we have the refugees that come from uh, Iraq or uh, uh, Iran, you know, it's, it becomes a little difficult there to prevent conflicts between these groups. And uh, you would also ask me how, how are we able to sort of, you know, filter through whether someone is refugee or not, oh, sorry, a queer or not. And for that, so we sort of have this, uh, mm, system or uh, classes in place wherein we uh, used to give, uh, you know, gender and sexual minority uh, classes every week, awareness programs every week. And we would tell people uh, if they have anything to tell us or anything to share with us, we would give them, you know, these papers to write through. And if, uh, you know, they would like anything the organizers see. And that we came to know that, oh, there were a lot of people here. <laughs> and, uh, we had an age group that we had to sort of, uh, you know, filter through. We had young teenagers from like 13, 14, 15, 16. And then we had people from 17, 18, 19, 20. Our oldest queer uh, person is around 88 years old. And he is the most amazing poet that I have known my entire life, I guess. The most amazing queer poetry that he writes in Arabic. And Although he has no idea about how pronouns work or how, you know, self-identity is all about. A lot of his poetry that he writes is on, uh, on all about how beautiful the world would have been if, you know, we started accepting queer people the way they are without questioning. So uh, there was this one poetry of his uh, that spoke about the this apricot and peach reference, how they look similar together, but yet they are so distinct. But, and the po poem literally goes like this, the apricot tree never asks the peach tree. 
you know how different they are but you know the way they germinated together something like that in those lines like you know they don't discriminate each other so who are again a very utopian sort of uh, thought of process you know and this poetry is something that sort of makes me you know motivated to go around the work that we do and uh, we also make sure that uh, uh these the refugees they are not you know uh, distant from the society and we help them get integrated back as via uh, providing them free education uh, and we have partnered up with certain universities to do that we have partnered with harvard university to give a uh, free evening classes because a lot of uh, these refugees are young students who had to leave their education and uh when you ask them where you would you want to go and study they would literally tell you places like how would we want to go to yale you want to go to uh, john hopkins university or you want to go to some university in canada and we try that to you know to try that to make them that of a possibility for them by giving them access to free you know lectures free classes we also partnered up with these prestigious universities mainly because they agreed to give free classes so we have evening batch of classes zoom classes for now to be given and they give them uh, free uh, courses so we have a, a full fledged bachelor's program four years bachelor's program uh, for uh, medical sciences and we have a five year bachelor uh, sorry not bachelor in bachelor's program for law and we also have a three years bachelor program for art uh, all coming from harvard and some other universities that are sort of sort of forgotten which because we keep getting offered uh, and we keep getting opportunities but we try to take up those opportunities uh, which will provide you know anything that is on the lines of sustainability anything on the lines of accessibility anything on the lines of availability because that is very important for us to go about and not just you know go about accepting anything that comes on our way now uh the challenges that we have also faced through during covid is running out of funds because uh uh some of the money that goes into you know uh taking care of these people and these individuals comes from your own pocket it would come from my own salary i would literally donate 100% of my salary to these people and their family and last year is when we had to shut you know sort of shut down one of our spaces in uh, in jordan because we could not host around 1000 uh, queer refugees uh, them mostly you know fleeing different countries and we were not able to host so many people and we sort of had to close one of our spaces on it was very painful to do that and you are in this position where you want to help at the same time you also aren't able to do anything because you are you know you know stuck in a pandemic lockdown here in india and the most you can do is try to reach out to you know these corporates or, or these big big ngos or any organizations that sort of thrive on saying that oh we help the people we help the uh, humanity uh so that's been all about in a nutshell about the spaces that i've worked with uh Uh, we had thought about expanding our spaces to other countries for as of now that again not possible because of covid uh but the common idea that we go with are our safe spaces are uh, they do not have hierarchies to be also to uh, share with and that we don't believe that uh, you know uh, an hierarchical safe space is a safe space we, we definitely don't believe in that aspect uh so i can take some of the questions here that is mentioned uh, is conversion therapy same as aversion therapy if this is illegal what are the loopholes through which practices slip through okay uh, aversion therapy i believe if i'm not wrong is like uh, it's this behavioral therapy that uh, one you know uh, that sort of uh, uh, like for example someone who uh, is undergoing uh, an addiction to smoking if i'm not wrong if i've read this properly is that they're giving a aversion therapy to sort of you know make them stop getting that habit of smoking on cigarettes 
if that's what it is, uh, there is a lot of difference between that and conversion therapy. Because conversion therapy thrives on the idea that you are able to convert someone from one identity to the other identity. So it lies in the idea that uh, you are this, but you can be converted into this. And that convert conversion comes at the expense of fear. It comes at the expense of your life being endangered. It comes at the expense of making you believe something that is out there and this is not true. So if that, you know, that is basis of conversion therapy. And it is also, uh, you know, in the basis of uh, uh, certain religious practices by certain people that oh you do this you will change your mind will automatically change or your feelings will automatically change uh i would recommend this this movie called boy erase i'm gonna type that down i'm gonna miss that it's on netflix A beautiful movie on conversion therapy so it talks about uh how this person gets sent to this conversion therapy camp in the u.s and how he sort of navigates through the entire uh you know, thing and like, and I'm, I must say that conversion therapy does not work at all, no matter how many years you're on it. It really does not work at all. And no matter who tells you that it works, it doesn't work. Uh, because you literally cannot change someone's orientation. And that's, you, you can't do that. And it's even if people test, uh, uh, you know, people, survivors from that therapy tell you that it is true, know that they are doing that out of fear of being judged, out of fear of being, you know, discriminated. Uh, what are the loopholes? The loopholes is mostly is that it is, you know, portrayed as something that would correct you. So, you know, the parents would naturally would believe that, oh, anything corrective is correct for our child or right for our child. Uh, another loophole is that because of, uh, although, because of it's not being so like, uh, uh, how do I say? Uh, strongly, uh, not getting the particular word. Strongly legislated or strongly, you know, uh, out there in such a way that if you uh, put someone through that, and you have consequences of it, enforced. Yes, thank you for that. Enforced in a way that people do get away with it. So even when I said that reputed hospitals get away with it, they do get away with it. Uh, and the loopholes is that, that there is a very little legal consequences that that hospital could also go through. It's because I remember uh, speaking to this lawyer and trying to get things, you know, paperwork in, paperwork to begin with. And when the lawyer had approached the hospital, they said that we don't, we don't perform this. We don't have a unit for this. We don't have a department. And it became very difficult to sort of give a proof because when you're undergoing that, you don't have access to your phone or you don't have access to any device that could help you respond. It. So that is one another loophole is that hospitals, uh, especially corporate hospitals, become very powerful tool in sort of saying that they definitely do not go or definitely do not. Uh, uh, if that answers up some of it, uh, I would happy to sort of go on to the next one. What are the experiences of being from a minority religion uh, at the same time being indecent? All right, so uh, experience of being a minority is very much out there from rampant Islamophobia to, you know, I'm sorry to use this word here, but leftist spaces being aggressive and like passive aggressive and dismissive of you. Uh, I used to think it used to be liberal spaces that it is, but even leftist spaces do this, and it is very disheartening. And it is sad because you are in that space mostly because uh, you think that the trauma is so much out there that people will understand it. But even in safe spaces, uh, queer safe spaces, uh, minority people are not treated well. They they are seen as uh, you know they are seen as illusioned people. They are seen that seen as someone who will, you know, transform others and will convert others also. I can, uh, without naming this space, I can give you an example of that, is that uh, the safe space that I was apart from more than three years, I have to leave it recently because of the trauma that I've faced from that space and from the people that I've faced from that space. And I have a lot of attachment to that space. It, it, it transformed me totally as a person. But, uh, when when it came to you know sort of 
handing me over the responsibilities of that space because one of the uh, facilitators or admins were called out uh, for their uh, behavior and actions. Uh, when they were leaving that space, uh, they were advised not to hand it over to a Muslim because a Muslim would change the way the space works. And that is very disheartening to know about. And imagine like giving three years, four years of your life to that space and you're being told that you will not be handed over the responsibility of the space because people fear your religion might impact the politics of the space. And I was shell-shocked, but I was not surprised. Uh, however, in the end, what happened basically was that I was given 50% role in it and I was asked specifically not to introduce uh, any part of religious politics into this. Imagine a political space trying to be it. That is, that is funny. And even in the leftist spaces that I've been with, uh, they constantly question me, they constantly ask me stupid questions, they constantly are Islamophobic and at the same time, you know, go around on their posts and say that, you know, this is Islamophobia. So that, that baffles me to the core because I'm like, what are you really standing up for? You know, how is it okay for you to, uh, you know, uh, degrade or, you know, humiliate or violate uh, uh, gender and sexual, sexual minorities? person's beliefs, but at the same time, cry, decry Islamophobia on your Instagram space. So that sort of uh, standards is something that I have never understood, may not ever understand. Uh, also, being intersex is uh, visibly out there is not a thing. Like you have very, very few people who are uh, openly, uh, you know, outright, not sorry, openly out there who identify themselves as intersex. Uh, a good example is Lalit Salvin, uh, the police constable from Maharashtra, Bead. Uh, so Lalit Salve, you all should read about Lalit Salve. Uh, he's, an, he, he's an inspiration to me. Uh, I will not say an icon because I believe in abolishing all sorts of icons. Uh, I'm not an icon for anyone. I'm just putting that out. Uh, if you consider me as an inspiration, please don't because I'm not an inspiration either. But if you thoroughly believe my story is an inspiration or I am an inspiration, please do consider using that inspiration as a weapon to, you know, divert your energies and attention to uh, various uh, fundraisers that are being held up. Uh, one, one of them uh, being the trans kitchen community in Chennai right now. Uh, I don't have a link to post that, but I would recommend that you all should uh, check out via your friends if you know of any uh, fundraisers that are being done for uh, gender and sexual minority, please, please do contribute to that. Uh, so, with like being out, uh, you know, openly visible intersex, is the one of the challenges that you face is that you are often confused with trans people, yes, and with trans identity of this, and you constantly have to explain people know it is a biological identity, a biological sex. It, not a gender identity. It's not, a, uh, it's not something that uh, you know. Uh, you decide one day and you see that you're. Uh, it's not something that you identify yourself with after a while and say that. You're. But however, I would say that self identification belongs to the person alone. A lot of intersex people in India, uh, uh, you know, identify themselves as trans people as a trans individuals as well. But uh, the problem or the sort of conflation part of conflict is that Western activists do not believe in this. They say that you keep trans identities away from intersex identities and they do not believe in the binary of male and female. So I've seen here in India that people say that, oh, I'm an intersex man or I'm an intersex woman. Western activists also go further and say that that does not exist for us. You're intersex, you're just but here in India, we, we do find people who say that they're an intersex woman, they have a trans woman as well. Uh, again, saying that self-identity belongs to them. And for me, my experiences have been very limited, mostly because wherever and whenever I can, I have identified myself as this man. And I use that privilege just to survive, I guess, because survival is very important as well for a minority because you have constant bombardment of different forces around you and you will pick up anything that acts as a means of survival for you. Uh, I hope that sort of, <coughs> sort of <coughs> sorry, answers your 
uh, query. Uh, please hydrate yourselves if you have heard to the TED talk and you're feeling bored right now and you're like, when will this torture end? <laughs> so I think we have, uh, Pushpa, we have roughly, I don't know how many more minutes left. If anyone wants to add something, ask something, critique something, I'm open to criticism. I love criticism. When people are like, oh, you cannot exist. And I'm like, watch me. <laughs> so please, uh, please do go ahead and share something if you want to ask anything or if you want to share something, if you want to say that, Mohammed, I don't like you, you're also welcome to share that. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, I have to say something now, I, or the last this thing is that I don't think anybody will say that they don't like you, but of course, and thank you too. But anyway, um, yeah, and uh, this is wonderful. And I know it was very tough, okay, and more so. Um, Perhaps because, uh, you know, you sometimes in spaces where people take for granted that you're very safe, you're, it's very private and all that. And sometimes if those are the most challenging spaces, I mean, I'm, I'm, here I mean the physical space also, then it becomes so many times more difficult. Yes, Tutti Fruity Penguin Booty. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's, my, right. that's my Instagram ID and, and uh, people, if anyone wants to connect, if anyone wants to leave a message, then we'll yeah, do that. Yeah, people please go, then you'll see how much more popular uh, Mama <laughs> is. Okay, right. Okay, so that was just, yeah. Um, yeah, well, you, you are popular. Okay, so, and uh, yeah, so Rafia says she loves the ID, the name. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so it has a very funny story from the original yeah, and, please share, please uh, share. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember a friend of mine, uh, they were very intrigued by uh, how a lot of people don't like the, the candy tutti frutti. Like, I, I swear I remember we all like sitting on that candy and we we're like, oh, it is so artificial and stuff. And like, we were like, yes. That is so true, you don't like that candy. And then they were like, oh, but Mohammed is so tooty fruity because they're so colorful that way. And I would, you know, literally wear like all colorful clothes and go go to these uh, safe space meetings. And they were like, oh, you should change your Instagram ID to tooty fruity. And at that very uh, year, I had sort of, uh, sort of slipped and sort of uh, injured my leg. So I was walking like a penguin, literally waddling my way to the, you know, people. And they were like, oh, look at your booty shake like a penguin. And I'm like, wow, that is an Instagram ID that, uh, you know, I would love to sort of make my own ID. And I realized that nobody else has that as my ID. Like nobody else has that name in the world. And I feel very unique to keeping that. And I don't so sort of... Uh, <laughs> sort of oh, want to change that, sort of, you know, want to go beyond that. I've got a lot of people saying that, oh, it's such a cringe. And I'm like, I, I don't care. It's unique for me. So that's all about my Instagram listing. And uh, if you do like reading, a lot of uh, a lot of my thoughts are on Instagram. So I write a lot of, so I attach a picture and I give whatever I feel is appropriate to that. So I do that a lot because I feel that sometimes you're not able to uh, convey your words while talking and you can write well. So I do that. I write and I express my thoughts. I'm not a good writer, so I cannot write good poems, but I try. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that, Mohammed. And um, so, yes, it's been, you know, in a way, also uh, tough because it's not easy, not only that, you know, uh, like it, it's also good that you use trigger warnings because sometimes you uh, you all have personal traumas, you have shared traumas and all that. And uh, I mean, I've, I've heard some of, uh, you know, your story earlier also. And uh, it, it sometimes feels so, you know, uh, 
painful that you have to ask somebody to share their uh, trauma or pain or challenges. But I guess uh, sharing also helps heal. It helps uh, inform, inspire, and maybe even question. So thanks so much for that. And uh, as I said, you make it all look so easy. Believe me, it's not at all like that, I know. And uh, it's fantastic that you started with accept acceptability is also part of accessibility, right? And uh, so, so these are all some very unique perspectives. And uh, of course, we love Tutti Fruity Penguin Beauty. You know, I can never get the booty right. Okay. So again, thanks so much. And then you didn't feel like an hour had passed and uh, so thankful for the infrastructure, the connectivity and the electricity, which came just on time. Okay. I know, right. Yeah. I'm so and glad like, for like the electricity we were just not sharing it in between. Yeah, we, we were like just sharing at the beginning of the session to the people who were around then. And Bangalore has like multiple seasons in the same day. <laughs> and today was one of those days. So it like was just pouring and pouring and pouring. Yes. And uh, anybody else has anything to ask or to say? Of course. You, uh, can, you can DM me as well on my Instagram and do that. Right, you, right, yeah, right. You can yeah. definitely yeah. do that. Yeah. I will get so, back to you. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Rung is also on uh, Insta at Rung2020. Then uh, we have uh, Citizen News Service or uh, more uh, active on Facebook and Twitter. That is CNS for short. So, and hopefully y'all, you know, we will continue to host. We had done some sessions in 2020 actually, uh, but uh, on different platforms. And then some of the snippets are already on our uh, wrong Insta page or they will keep uh, being put up there. And uh, more sessions like snippets from today's session, from the uh, previous session. And we will bring more, you know, uh, revolving around uh, gender and intersecting identities and issues. Well, every, I mean, you know, actually, it's never that gender is something very uh, different or unique. It is there in all of us. It's just about how we, uh, you know, see the topic, or, not to see there's a topic, it's not just a topic, it's an identity, it's part of everybody. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So thanks again so much, Mohamad. And then, you know, more thank you, power everyone. And strong, thank you, Pushpa. And... Thank you for Rang. Thank you for Love. Rang. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, please, 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 please don't forget to hydrate yourself, a glass of water or anything. And if you're fasting, please, please make sure you drink water a lot after you reach. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thanks for that. Thank you, Pushpa. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody.